<laughs> well, thank you, Dimitri, for that lovely introduction. And I, I want to thank, really, thank you all for asking me to join you today at this conference and to be part of the continuing and necessary inquiry into how the ideas and legacy of Hyman Minsky can inform and shape our understanding of financial markets and the economy. My remarks today are going to expand on remarks I made in March to the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, in which I explored the ways in which monetary and bank regulatory policy might reduce unemployment, economic marginalization, and the financial vulnerability of millions of moderate and low-income working Americans. Today, I'm interested in continuing this exploration by examining an issue of growing saliency that macroeconomic models used at central banks and by academics have not traditionally emphasized. And specifically, that's how such economic marginalization and financial vulnerability associated with stagnant wages and rising inequality contributed to the run-up of the financial crisis and how such marginalization and vulnerability could be relevant in the current recovery. To isolate my proper subject here, I want to be clear that I'm not engaging this afternoon with the concern that many Americans have that excessive inequality undermines American ideals and values. Nor will I be investigating the social costs associated with wide distributions of income and wealth. Rather, I want to zero in on the question of whether inequality itself is undermining our country's economic strength according to available macroeconomic indicators. Economists have documented that widening income and wealth inequality has been one of the most notable structural changes to the U.S. economy since the late 1970s. This change represents a dramatic departure from the three decades prior to that time when Americans enjoyed broadly rising incomes and shared prosperity. Indeed, many of you in the room have shed important light on the recent trends in inequality and on the potential role of fiscal policy in addressing them. You've also explored how these trends are relevant to issues of financial stability. I won't attempt to repeat this strong line of research and analysis. Instead, my remarks today are specifically focused on adding to the conversation about how such disparities in income and wealth could be relevant for a macro understanding of the financial crisis and the recovery and the appropriate course of monetary policy today. I'm going to argue that at the start of this recession, an, unusual, an unusually large number of low- and middle-income households were vulnerable to the shocks that sparked the financial crisis. These households, which had endured 30 years of very sluggish real-wage growth, held an unusually large share of their wealth in housing, much of it financed with debt. As a result, over time, their exposure to house prices had increased dramatically. Thus, as in past recessions, suffering in the Great Recession, though widespread, was most painful and most perilous for low- and middle-income households, which were also more likely to be affected by job loss and had little wealth to fall back on. Moreover, I'm persuaded that because of how hard these lower- and middle-income households were hit, the recession was worse, and the recovery has been weaker. The recovery has been hampered by a continuation of longer-term trends that have reduced employment prospects for those at the lower end of the income distribution and have produced weak wage growth. Of course, it's not part of the Federal Reserve's mandate to address inequality directly. But I want to explore these issues today because the answers may have implications for the Federal Reserve's efforts to understand the recession and conduct policy in a way that contributes to a stronger pace of recovery. Traditionally, the distribution of wealth and income has not been a primary consideration in the way most macroeconomists think about business cycles. But if inequality played a role in the financial crisis, 
if it contributed to the severity of the recession, and if its effects create a lingering economic headwind today, then perhaps our thinking and our macroeconomic models should be adjusted. Despite the tentative nature of these conclusions, I do think it's vital to explore these issues, and in the spirit of Minsky, I hope my remarks spur more inquiry and discussion. I should also note that the views I express are my own, and not necessarily those of my colleagues on the Board of Governors or the Federal Open Market Committee. In order to level set our understanding, let me begin by reviewing some of the changes to the structure of income, wealth, and debt in the years leading up to the Great Recession, changes that have had significant implications for the well-being of most American households. Long before the recession, decades before in fact, income data show only sluggish increases in real incomes for low and middle income American households and more rapid increases for high income households resulting in a much greater concentration of income among those at the very top of the income distribution. As just one example of the broader trend, according to the Congressional Budget Office, between 1979 and 2007, inflation-adjusted pre-tax income for a household in the top 1% more than doubled, while in contrast, income for a household in the middle of the income distribution increased less than 20%. Over these pre-recession years, the share of pre-tax income accruing to the top 1% of households also doubled from 10% to 20%, while the share accruing to the bottom 40% fell from 13% to 10%. These growing disparities of total income are largely due to the increasing concentration of labor income, which, on average, accounted for more than 70% of all income over this period. In addition, the distribution of other sources of total income, such as profits from small businesses, capital gains and dividend income, rental income and the like, they also became more concentrated over this period. Many have argued that these disparities in income are hindering economic growth through their effects on consumption. Intuitively, one might assume that the growing concentration of income at the top could lead to less consumer spending and aggregate demand, as wealthier households tend to save more of their additional income than others. However, there is no definitive research indicating that these income disparities show stable differences in the marginal propensity to consume across households with different income. More generally, the evidence is equivocal as to whether there is an empirical relationship between higher income inequality and reduced aggregate demand. In my view, understanding the links between greater concentrations of income, variation in spending patter patterns throughout the income distribution, and the effect of that variation on aggregate consumption and ultimately growth requires more exploration. But since household behavior is surely driven by more than the size of the paycheck coming in the proverbial front door, the distribution of wealth, as distinct from the distribution of income, could have clearer implications for the macro economy. Indeed, wealth inequality is greater than income inequality in the United States. For example, according to the Survey of Consumer Finances, which is a survey conducted every three years by the Federal Reserve Board, <laughs> the top one-fifth of families ranked by income owned 72% of the total wealth in the economy in 2010, whereas families in the bottom one-fifth of the income distribution together owned only 3% of total wealth in 2010. Hence, families with more modest incomes have much less wealth to cushion themselves against income shocks, such as unemployment. For example, in 2010, the median value of financial assets was less than $1,000 for families in the lowest income quintile. Moreover, what wealth low and middle income families do have is typically concentrated in housing. For families in the top quintile of income, the value of residential properties accounted for about 15% of total wealth in 2010. For families in the middle and lower half of the income distribution, the ratio of their home values to total net value or to total net worth was near 70%. In contrast, stock market wealth and the value of other securities constitutes a high share of wealth for high and middle income families, but a very small share of wealth for low and middle income families. 
Because the wealth of people at the lower end of the distribution is concentrated in housing, these households are disproportionately exposed to swings in house prices. This compositional effect was intensified during the housing boom, as the share of wealth accounted for by housing grew even faster for low- and middle-income families than for high-income families. That said, the increases in home ownership and house values during the boom were largely financed by rising mortgage debt. <clears throat> Thus, the direct positive effect of rising housing prices on most households' net worth was largely offset by the negative effect of increased debt that households took on. On net, mortgage debt and home values moved up together. But when house prices began falling, the mortgage debt and repayment obligations remained. To be sure, the increase in mortgage debt prior to the recession accrued, occurred across all types of households. But it was families with modest incomes and wealth largely in their homes that were the most vulnerable to subsequent drops in home values. The question then arises as to why households with poor income prospects sought out levels of mortgage debt that would ultimately prove so problematic. Putting aside the practice in the run-up to the crisis of lenders steering households to mortgage debt products that were more costly than such households may have otherwise qualified for, one reason may have been that many households in the middle and lower end of the income distribution whose wage earnings were stagnant didn't recognize the long run and persistent trends underlying their lack of income growth. If households thought they were merely going through a rough patch, it would have been quite reasonable for them to borrow money to smooth through it, to start a business, for example, or to send a child to college. At the same time, many people believed that the sharp increase in their home values had made them permanently richer and that house prices would never turn down, a belief that appears to have been shared by many households in the upper part of the income distribution as well. In fact, purchasing a house using debt was a profitable investment in the early 2000s. While it's hard to know with any certainty what these individual households believed at the time, it seems quite plausible to me, as others have argued, that stagnant wages and rising inequality in combination with the relaxation of underwriting standards led to an increase in the use of credit unsupported by greater income. Given these developments, when house prices fell, household finances were struck a devastating blow. The resulting fallout magnified this initial shock, ushering in the Great Recession. Let's lay this argument out in a little more detail. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, low to middle income families held a disproportionate share of their assets in housing prior to the financial crisis, and hence were very exposed to what was a historic decline in house prices. And so, while total net, uh, household net worth fell 15% in real terms between 2000 and 2010, median net worth fell almost 40%. This difference reflects the amplified effect that housing had on wealth changes in the middle of the wealth distribution. The unexpected drop in house prices on its own reduced both households' wealth and their access to credit, likely leading them to pull back their spending. In particular, underwater borrowers and heavily indebted households were left with little collateral, which limited their access to additional credit and their ability to refinance at lower interest rates. Indeed, some studies have shown that spending has declined more for indebted households. Compounding the effect of falling house prices on household wealth and credit was the fact that these low to middle income households are also composed of some of the groups that have historically borne the brunt of downturns in the labor market. During recessions, the young, the less educated, and minorities are more likely to experience flat or declining wages, reduced hours, and unemployment. While this disparity is not a new phenomenon, dealing with a loss in labor income during the most recent recession was a heightened challenge to households that had mortgage obligations and no other forms of wealth to cushion the blow. The adverse developments in the labor market added to the difficulty most households were having in repaying their existing debts and in accessing credit 
during the recession. These low to middle income households that bore the strains in both housing and labor markets and had little wealth cushion had more difficulty making payments on their mortgages and other consumer credit debt. For example, among the mortgages originated from 2004 to 2008, almost 25% of those in low income neighborhoods were foreclosed on or in serious delinquency as of 2011 more than twice the rate of mortgages originated in higher income neighborhoods. Higher income households had also taken on debt and were affected by declines in asset prices. But these households entered the recession with a larger wealth buffer and higher income, so they generally were still able to service their debts. The sharp rise in defaults and delinquencies put extraordinary stress on most households' finances intensified the financial crisis and exacerbated the effects of the initial economic shocks. Indeed, a rapid downward spiral of tighter credit, declines in asset prices, rising unemployment and falling demand caused severe distress and a pullback in spending that was ultimately widespread among households. I've argued that rising inequality and stagnating wages may have led households to borrow more and to pin their hopes for economic advancement on rising home values, developments that exacerbated the severity of the financial crisis and recession. Now, we are nearly four years into the recovery, which has been weak. In my view, this same confluence of factors has also contributed to the tepid recovery. If my theory about why households overextended themselves before the financial crisis is correct, then it's likely also true that households have had a rude awakening in the years since. Not only did they receive an, un an unwelcome shock to their net current wealth, but they also undoubtedly have come to realize that house prices will not rise indefinitely and that their labor income prospects are less rosy than they had believed. As a result, they are curtailing their spending in an effort to rebuild their nest eggs and may also be trimming their budgets in order to bring their debt levels into alignment with new economic realities. In this case, the effects of the plunge in net wealth and the jump in unemployment on subsequent spending have been long lasting and lingering. Overall debt, limit, uh, debt levels remain higher than before the house price boom and many families continue to struggle to keep up with their monthly payments. Although many households have significantly reduced their debt levels, many others probably have far to go. It's hard to know just what the optimal debt to income ratio is, but in my view, households will likely aim for something lower than before the financial crisis. Households are probably working toward lower, more manageable debt service obligations. The heightened uncertainty in the recession may have raised the desired level of financial buffers and to the extent that households saw the negative shocks to house prices and income as permanent, they are reducing their spending and thus their demand for new borrowing. While the process of household deleveraging has affected the spending and borrowing of many households, there's no doubt that the process has been more acute for those that have experienced unemployment, underemployment, or slower wage gains. To make matters worse, there's also some evidence to suggest that the factors that contributed to the rise in inequality and the stagnation of wages in the bottom half of the income distribution, such as technological change that favors those with a college education and globalization, are still at play in the recovery and perhaps may have accelerated. About two-thirds of all job losses in the recession were in middle-wage occupations, such as manufacturing, skilled construction, and office administration jobs. But these occupations have accounted for less than one-fourth of subsequent job gains. In contrast, the decline in lower-wage occupations, such as retail sales, food service, and other low-paying service jobs, accounted for only one-fifth of job loss and more than one half of total job gains in the recovery. It's not only the occupational and industrial distribution of the new jobs that poses challenges for workers and their families struggling to make ends meet, but also the fact that many of the jobs that have returned are part-time 
or make use of temporary arrangements, popularly known as contingent work. The flexibility of these jobs may be beneficial for workers who want or need time to address their family needs. However, workers in these jobs often receive less pay and fewer benefits than traditional full-time or permanent workers. They're much likely to benefit from the protections of labor and employment laws, and often they have no real pathway to upward mobility in the workplace. Wage gains have remained more muted than is typical during the recovery. While this phenomenon likely partly reflects the trends in job creation that I've already discussed, weak wage growth also reflects the severe nature of this crisis. Typically, those who are laid off during recession struggle to find reemployment that, that is of comparable quality to their previous job. And research has shown that on average, a person's income remains depressed for decades following job loss and that income losses over one's working life are especially severe when the job occurs during a recession. Indeed, while average wages have continued to increase, albeit slowly, on an annual basis for persons who have remained employed, the average wage for new hires has declined since 2010. Although it's too early to state with certainty what the long-term effect of this recession will be, on the earnings potential of those who lost their jobs, given the severity of the job loss and sluggishness of the recovery, with nearly nine million jobs lost and still almost two and a half million jobs below pre-recession employment levels, it's very likely that for many households, future labor earnings will be well below what they had anticipated in the years before the recession. I've focused most of my remarks on the experiences of households at the lower ends of the income and wealth distributions, those households whose incomes improved the least in the years prior to the financial crisis and that suffered disproportionately as a result of the crisis and the ensuing recession. To be clear, my approach of starting with inequality and differences across households is not a feature of most analyses of the macro economy. And the channels I've emphasized generally do not play key roles in most macro models. The typical macroeconomic analysis focuses on the general equilibrium behavior of representative households and firms, thereby abstracting from the consequences of inequality and other heterogeneity among households. And instead, focusing on the aggregate measures of spending instruments, uh, spending determinants, including current income, wealth, interest rates, credit supply, and confidence or pessimism. In certain circumstances, this abstraction might be a reasonable simplification. For example, if the changes in the distribution of income or wealth and the implications of those changes for the overall economy are regular features of business cycles, then even an aggregate model without an explicit focus on distributional issues would capture those historical irregularities. However, the narrative I've emphasized places economic inequality and the differential experiences of American families, particularly the highly adverse experiences of those least well positioned to absorb their realized shocks closer to the front and center of the macroeconomic adjustment process. The effects of increasing income and wealth disparities, specifically the stagnating wages and sharp increase in household debt in the years leading up to the crisis, combined with the rapid decline in house prices and contraction of credit that followed, may have resulted in dynamics that differ from historical experience and which therefore are not well captured by aggregate models. How these factors have interacted and the implications for the aggregate economy are subject to debate, but I've laid out some possible channels through which there could be effects and that I believe represent some particularly fruitful areas for continued research. The arguments that I've laid out suggest that paying attention to the experiences of different types of households may be important for the way we understand and interpret the macroeconomic events of the past several years. As a consequence, 
These differential expectations may also have implications for the conduct of monetary policy. Arguably, the FOMC's conduct of monetary policy in recent years has in part been designed to address this particular landscape. In response to continuing low levels of resource utilization, the FOMC has kept monetary policy highly accommodative by keeping its primary policy instrument, the federal funds rate, at an exceptionally low level. By supplementing this move with forward guidance about the funds rate and by initiating unconventional policy actions such as large-scale asset purchases. <coughs> One channel through which these policies operate is by putting downward pressure on longer-term interest rates, helping enable households to refinance their mortgages. Lower interest rates also support the prices of homes and other assets, which can lead to additional spending. To be sure, though, every household is different, and the particular mix of assets, skills, and opportunities that each has will determine how much it's able to share in the recovery. But accommodative monetary policy that lifts economic activity more generally is expected to increase the odds of good outcomes for many American families. But that said, it's also relevant to consider whether the unusual circumstances, the outsized role of housing wealth in the portfolios of low and middle income households, the increased use of debt during the boom, and the subsequent unprecedented shocks to the housing market may have attenuated the effectiveness of monetary policy during the depths of the recession. Households that have been through foreclosure or have underwater mortgages or are otherwise credit constrained are less able than other households to take advantage of the lower interest rates, either for home buying or for other purposes. In my view, these effects likely clog some of the channels through which monetary policy traditionally works. As the housing market recovers, though, I think it's possible that accommodative monetary policy could be, become more potent. As house prices rise, more and more households have enough home equity to gain renewed access to mortgage credit and the ability to refinance their homes at lower rates. The staff at the Federal Reserve Board has estimated that house price increases of 10% or less from current levels would be sufficient for about 40% of underwater homeowners to regain positive equity. It's my view that understanding the long-run trends in income and wealth across different households is important in understanding the dynamics of the macro economy and thus also may be relevant for setting monetary policy to best reach our goals of maximum employment and price stability. I believe that the accommodative policies of the FOMC um, and the concerted effort we have made to ease conditions in the mortgage markets will help the economy continue to gain traction. And the resulting expansion in employment will likely improve income levels at the bottom of the distribution. However, given the long-standing trends toward greater income and wealth inequalities, it's unlikely that cyclical improvements in the labor markets will do much to reverse these trends. It strikes me that macroeconomists are far from a comprehensive understanding of how wealth and income inequality may affect business cycle dynamics. My remarks today are given in the spirit of describing how that relationship might be further explored. I've said, again, nothing about the social costs associated with such trends nor have I provided much detail on what is occurring at the top end of the income and wealth distribution and the effects of those trends on the recovery. Nonetheless, I believe that given the wide income and wealth disparities in the United States, this area is ripe for more research. In recent years, the Federal Reserve Board has increased its efforts to measure and understand differences in the economic situations faced by different types of families particularly strong source of data to improve our understanding of the role for inequality and heterogeneity is, again, the SCF. The Triennial Survey of Consumer Finances marks its 30th anniversary this year as the field work for the 2013 survey begins this month. The data we collect on U.S. families are a fundamental input for many different types of research projects being undertaken by board economists in other government agencies and research centers and in academia. 
In addition, the board in, in, is engaged in partnership with um, other members of the Federal Reserve System in a wide range of analysis and research using rich and timely data on households' use of consumer credit. And the board continues to support direct efforts to understand differences in spending and saving behavior across households, such as studies of stimulus policies in the Reuters University of Michigan surveys of consumers. There's much work to be done on understanding the ways in which income and wealth inequality and other forms of household heterogeneity affect aggregate behavior and the implications for monetary policy. The times demand that we continue to analyze such dynamics and their implications, again, in partnership with academics, the Federal Reserve System colleagues, and a spectrum of policy analysts. Thank you again for your attention and the creative thought that you bring to today's economic challenges.